But, did I get you this time? I'm sorry, you guys know the drill with these spooky videos. Anyway, how's it going guys, it's Nate here, and thanks for popping in on another trek through the frozen lands of Skyrim. A vast and narrative-rich realm, with hundreds of inhabitants, locations, and stories. But not every tale in The Elder Scrolls V has a satisfying conclusion, and many of the game's plot lines and people can oftentimes leave us asking numerous questions. So, we've been through this introduction 13 times now. Just curl up by the fire and relax, as we dive right into five more mysteries regarding the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Part 14. Starting off, who in oblivion is Eren? Well, okay, that's actually a pretty simple question to answer. He's an Imperial living in Riften alongside his companion, though not significant other, Miol the Lioness. Though, the real question I want to ask is, what exactly is this dude's backstory? You see, Eren himself is presented as a very minor character. He has like less than a half dozen lines of dialogue, and doesn't really interact with the Dragonborn much at all. Most of the very little we know about him comes from the woman he seems to be following around all the time, Miol the Lioness. In order to understand Eren's story, we'll first have to understand hers. Miol is a vigilante Nord warrior, with a desire to root out all things evil, who can become a potential follower, and even spouse, assuming you complete her associated quests. She's not from Riften. In fact, she's only moved here recently, spending the last few years traveling across Tamriel, where she spent most of her time assisting villages in need and hunting down bandits. She's basically a superhero, minus the superpowers, I suppose. Anyway, back on point. Not long ago, Miol was in Skyrim, fighting her way through the dwarven ruins of Mizinshaleft, when she was wounded by a machine. Apparently, somehow immediately after this happened, she was found by Eren, who drug her out of the dungeon while she was too wounded to move, and took her all the way back to his home in Riften, where he nursed her back to health. From there, once she was finally able to stand on her own two legs, she decided to stay in the city, so she could try to root out all of the crime and corruption that's so rampant here. And to this day, still lives with Eren. But does any of that story seem a bit, you know, kind of weird? I mean, somehow, apparently shortly after she was wounded, this Eren fellow just randomly showed up and found Miol in the nick of time, dragging her out of an incredibly dangerous dungeon and bringing her all the way back to his house in Riften? How the heck? That's quite a heroic feat. Not only would it take remarkable combat skill, which Eren doesn't seem to demonstrate, but also an incredibly strong moral character to help someone so in need. It's just kind of odd. Then there's the question of how rich he appears to be. Eren walks around wearing fine clothes all the time, and owns a nice house in Riften. The dude is clearly very well off, but the game provides literally no explanation behind how he obtained such fortunes. We don't know what his job is or was or if he inherited the money, we have no clue. While it's easy to write this all off as maybe just some lazy writing on Bethesda's end, some players do suspect there may be more at play here. One popular theory is that Eren could be an ex-member of the Dark Brotherhood, arguing that maybe Eren was a long time ago given a contract to kill Miol, but while he was pursuing her, maybe he fell in love with her. Perhaps he was stalking her while she entered that dwarven ruin of Mizinshaleft, and when she was wounded, he decided he just couldn't let her die, and took her all the way back to his place in Riften. This could explain his exorbitant wealth, and is frankly one of the only possible explanations behind how he could have found her so timely. But even then, if that were the case, you would think we'd hear more about Eren when we joined the Brotherhood, or that BGS would have planted in some more references. So while fun to consider, it's unlikely in my opinion. Who is this man? How did he get so rich? How and why did he save Miol in her hour of need? Only he may know. And he's got, like, six lines of dialogue, none of which give us any clues. Next on our list, what's going on with Lilith Maidenloom? Or, more specifically, what did Bethesda have planned for her? 
So, this mystery is a bit meta, concerning what is likely quite a bit of cut content. But nonetheless, it's still pretty interesting to examine. So, in Skyrim, Lilith Maidenloom is an elderly woman who owns and lives at the Whiterun Stables, just outside of the city. Though it's mostly run by her son Skolvar and his son, her grandson, Jervar, who both live with her. Lilith herself mostly spends her days shopping in the city's markets and sitting by the fire. But there's evidence there's a lot more to this old Nord than meets the eye. While most of her dialogue is fairly unremarkable, elderly lady stuff, in one line she may say to you while interacting with her, she ominously references Maven Blackbriar as a close acquaintance. Take a listen. My friend Maven and I, have you met Maven in Riften? We know our place in this world, know the place of others too. Maven Blackbriar is, of course, the crooked matriarch of the Blackbriar crime family in Riften, and she effectively controls the entire hold, and wields enormous dark influence across all of Skyrim, thanks to her vast sums of wealth and relationships with some of the world's more notorious enterprises. So what's this seemingly fragile, kind old lady doing apparently sharing a bond with a character like that? Well, things get even stranger when you realize that Lilith's own grandson, Jervar, is considered in the game's files to have a negative relationship with her. There isn't much in gameplay itself that suggests Jervar hates his Mima, but if you decide to kill Lilith, there's a chance he'll send you a note, thanking you for doing so. So, this woman has a grandson that hates her, and strong ties to one of the world's premier criminal syndicates. What's going on? Well, the answer seems to lie in Skyrim's creation kit. As in the game's data, Lilith is set to belong to a faction that very much does not exist. Lilith, and indeed both of her relatives, are technically members of the Maiden Lou Manor faction, and there's even object IDs referencing keys to a non-existent building called Maidenloo Manor in the game's engine. This seems to suggest that at one point in Skyrim's development, the Maidenlooms were supposed to be a much more prominent family and have their own estate, rather than all live cramped together in a tiny stable building on the city's outskirts. Perhaps they would have been a major player in Whiterun's politics, like the Greymanes or the Battleborns. It would explain Lilith's mysterious connections to Maven, and what we've dug up in the game files. Alas, for whatever reason, it seems Bethesda decided against going through with that potential narrative, or whatever their original plans were. And now the Maiden Looms are but another small family, with little of obvious significance. Coming in at number three, this one is less of a pressing mystery, and more of just a fun question to ask, seen as the answer is, at this point, irrelevant. But nonetheless, would Potema Septim have been able to claim the Ruby Throne? So, Potema Septim, also known as the Wolf Queen, for those of you who don't know, was the granddaughter of Cyrodiil's Emperor Uriel Septim III thousands of years ago, way back in the early Third Era. From a young age, she was regarded as a particularly sinister child, with a knack for thieving and trying to hurt and blackmail others. Being the granddaughter of an emperor, at age 14 she was eventually married off to the ruler of Solitude, Skyrim's capital, King Mantiarco, where she bore a child with him, and eventually, after Mantiarco died, Potema's son took up the throne. However, with him being so young, Potema acted as regent, and was effectively the real queen of Solitude. Long story short, one thing led to another, and Potema eventually decided that she wanted to be not just the queen of Solitude, but the empress of the entire empire itself. And so, she aligned herself with dark powers, and raised legions of undead armies with vampire generals, and marched off to capture Cyrodiil. The ensuing conflict would be known as the War of the Red Diamond. And thankfully for all of us, Potema and her evil forces lost out, with her ultimately dying after the rightful emperor laid siege to Solitude. Of course, during the events of Skyrim, specifically the side quest, The Man Who Cried Wolf, we learn that just because Potema's been dead for thousands of years, doesn't necessarily mean that she isn't a problem anymore. As at Wolf Skull Cave, 
a small cave in northern Hoffingar, a small clan of necromancers has gathered together, where they're attempting to summon Potema's very soul, and then bind it to their will. After hearing about this dilemma, as it's reported to the Jarl of Solitude and her thanes, we the player can intervene and stop the ritual. Although, despite putting an end to the necromancer's plot, our troubles still won't be over, as now Potema's soul will technically be free, and she'll go off and start trying to build an undead army out of her tomb in Solitude's catacombs, so she can try and conquer the world or something, which isn't very kind of her. We'll have to go all the way down to Potema's tomb, defeat her spirit, and destroy her remains to complete the quest. And finally, once and for all, banish her from the mortal realm. It's a neat little mission, but something to consider is that Potema Septim actually very well may have had the strongest claim to the Imperial Throne of anyone in the world today. With the rest of the Septim bloodline gone, having been killed off following the events of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, she would have been the only soul on Nern with a direct link to Tiber Septim. And funnily enough, some of Skyrim's characters even comment on this. Folk Firebeard, who gives you the quest, mentions after you've successfully vanquished Potema, that if she did manage to march on the Imperial City again, she'd probably have the right of it. And this sentiment is also echoed by Solitude's court wizard, Sibyl Stentor. Ironically, if she were alive today, she'd be the only living member of the Septon bloodline. By all rights, she would now be Empress. Which is both hilarious and terrifying. Now, of course, it's very unlikely that many people would willingly bow to a 2,000-year-old demon ghost lady, no matter who her ancestors were, but by all accounts, the Ruby Throne does appear to be her right. Something else that's pretty fun to imagine is would the Blades have been obligated to protect her? You see, back in all previous Elder Scrolls games before Skyrim, the Blades were sworn to protect the Septim Emperors of the Cyrodelic Empire. After the conclusion of the Elder Scrolls IV, when the last Septim Emperor died, then they sort of broke away and just started acting as their own independent organization. But if Potema comes back, reintroducing that bloodline, would they be bound to their oaths once again? It's a funny thing to consider. I guess at the end of the day, whatever would have happened matters very little, as thankfully the Dragonborn put an end to Potema's evil scheme. For a fourth spot, we have what is perhaps one of the greatest mysteries relevant not only to Skyrim, but the entire Elder Scrolls universe. What on Earth, or I guess Nern, happened to Atmora? So, Atmora is a place, or maybe was a place, as we'll get to in a second, that's sort of a big deal. According to legend, Atmora was an ancient continent that existed north of Tamriel tens of thousands of years ago. It's where mankind is said to have originated from. Allegedly, throughout the Merithic era, waves of humans made the journey south from Atmora to the shores of Tamriel, where they would eventually evolve to become the Nords, Bretons, and Imperials we know today. Migrants continued coming south from the continent all the way up to the year 68 of the First Era, when, according to the third edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire, which is where we get most of our information on Atmora from, the last ships from the continent arrived in Tamrielic ports, although they were allegedly, quote, full of corpses, suggesting something horrifying must have transpired. But no further attempt to elaborate is made. Apparently, after this, nearly all contact with Atmora just went dark. There were supposedly Tamrielic expeditions to the region since, though they report it being little more than an icy, barren wasteland, devoid of any signs of life, and still, no one's been able to successfully produce a map yet. Now, something a bit weird that contradicts what the Imperial Pocket Guide tells us is the fact that it's generally accepted Tiber Septim, the founder of the Septim Empire, was the real last migrant from Atmora to Tamriel apparently leaving the continent sometime in the 800s of the Second Era, many years after those last couple of ships of bodies were supposed to have arrived. This tale only adds to our confusion. But regardless of where the truth may lie, it seems relatively obvious that something catastrophic has overtaken Atmora, if even today modern sailors are unable to document it. 
Now, of course, over the years, there have been many community theories floated around what exactly happened. Some have argued that Amora may not even be its own continent at all, but instead a part of what we know as Akavir. Others allege that the land may not just be frozen in temperature, but time as well, since all of the region's dragons supposedly moved down to Tamriel alongside man all those ages ago. Dragons, of course, being the children of Akatosh, have a special relationship with time. Could it be that the expeditions heading out to Atmora aren't visiting Atmora in the present, but perhaps in the past or in some frozen dimension? We may never know. A piece of information that doesn't necessarily get us any closer to the right answer here is that Michael Kirkbride, one of Bethesda's writers for the Elder Scrolls franchise, released a sketch that depicts Talos quote-unquote farewelling the king of Atmora in the late Second Era. As you can see from the sketch, the king of Atmora is absolutely huge, implying that the land may have at one point been inhabited by strange giant creatures. Now, I should also point out that this also isn't necessarily canon. Kirkbride released this after his time at Bethesda came to an end, so it's technically fanfiction, though it's like really well informed. At the end of the day, whatever's going on in Atmora, whatever beings once inhabited it, and whatever fate it met, are all elusive questions we likely won't have answers to for a very, very long time. And finally, to wrap this video up, we have a mystery that's a lot less grand in the whole scheme of things, as it doesn't concern an entire missing continent or civilization of people. No, instead, this centers around one single guy's story. Southeast of the Wreck of the Brinehammer, on Skyrim's northern shores, we can find a small, overturned boat. When we approach it, we'll be attacked by two mud crabs. However, what's underneath the boat is of particular interest. Well, there's a lot of junk, there's some Alto wine, a knapsack containing some random leveled loot, some boots, mud crab chitin, a copy of the book Daughter of the Nibbin, which tells the history of Braville, but notably amongst all of that is also what's left of a human skeleton and a scimitar sword. Scimitars are, of course, the famous curved swords of Red Guards from Hammerfell. What on earth is one doing all the way here in the northernmost peak of Skyrim? Surely this vessel couldn't have belonged to an Alakir warrior. Hammerfell's all the way on the eastern coast, and this... well, it's north, in the Sea of Ghosts, an incredibly cold region. And then there's the question of what they would be doing on such a small vessel. I mean, the Sea of Ghosts are literally known for storms and inconsistent weather patterns. So why someone would make a trek out on that sea in a boat this tiny just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Oh well, whatever this poor soul's tale was, only they know. And something tells me we're not going to be able to get them to talk. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Our 14th installment of Mysteries Regarding the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. Which of the various questionable plot lines and narratives piqued your interest the most, and which should we explore next time? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.